Good morning. I'm Peter Scully and I'm your chair for today's webinar. Welcome to what is the third event in the, this year's presidential speaker series, Alternative Economic Thinking. And this focuses on whether traditional economic models are still fit for purpose and able to tackle many of the deep, deep and difficult issues faced by society all over the world, from climate change to rising inequality. The series looks to bring together experts from a range of economic disciplines along with the IFO's own thought leadership community to discuss and debate whether alternative economic thinking is required to address these various challenges facing society, and then what the theories could mean for the actual profession and its work. Throughout the series, we'll be looking to provide a platform for prominent contributors within our own thought leadership community so that members and others can understand the perspectives from a wide range of parties. The full videos in the first two talks in the series, if we move on to the next slide, this, uh, they're available uh, for you to look at in the IFOA's own virtual learning environment and also the YouTube channel as well. Please also sign up for the fourth event in our presidential speaker series. Uh, this is on Thursday this week, and it's on the power of purposeful business. It looks to critically examine the case for purposeful business and using rigorous evidence and real life examples to show what works and critically what doesn't work. Today's event will focus on the work of New Capital Consensus, a project led by Chatham House, Finstick, which is part of the IFOA, the University of Leeds and Radix Big Ten. It's looking to provide a systems thinking approach to understand the current system, financial systems, uh, investment stocks, flows and interrelationships. It aims to use this to understand leverage points which will enable system wide change. So to help us discuss this really important topic, uh, we've assembled uh, an expert panel from New Capital Consensus, and I'm pleased to introduce them to you just now. Uh, first speaking today will be Anna Yang. She's Executive Director of Chatham House's Sustainability Accelerator, and her interests focus on how to drive change uh, for fairer and more sustainable future. Our next speaker after that is Ashok Gupta. Ashok is Chair of Finstick, which is the Actual Professions Systems Thinking Group. He's also chair of Mercer Limited and a non-executive director at Sun Life Financial. And the third speaker today is Professor Ian Clatcher. Ian is professor of pensions and finance at University of Leeds Business School. As with uh, many IFWA talks, um, the, a lot of the richness and a lot of additional learning comes from the questions and answers that people, people have and the discussion that follows the main event. So we'd encourage you today to, to um, contribute your questions and comments, uh, please do this using the question and answer functionality uh, within Zoom. If you can ask that, then we'll be able to uh, select questions to, to answer from there and we'll aim to get through as many as we can. We do have a large amount of time allocated for question and answers around 25 minutes, so please, please do come up with, um, with your questions. Okay, I'm, I'm now going to ask Anna to, to introduce us to New Capital Consensus. So uh, Anna, if you could uh, let us let us know about New Capital Consensus and what it's okay. doing. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so good, good morning, everyone. Um, so could we move to the next slide and can very quickly? So what is the New Capital Consensus? So it is a consortium of partners. So uh, that we have the objective to understand the leverage points in the UK financial system so that we can encourage long term investment that achieve wider societal objective, whether it's environmental, climate, social or and or social objective. Uh, we have, as Peter has mentioned, we have we are part of a wider team, Finstick, Chatham House Sustainability Accelerator, University of Leeds and Radix. We also have a um, group of advisory panel who challenge us, uh, who contribute to very, very, in, uh, very, very uh, interesting insights. So you can see the list here from Sir Keith Skiot, Charlotte Clark, David Pitt Watson, Doc, Dr. Nicola Rangers, and Sir Steve Webb. And we also have a supporter, a funding support and thought partnership from Bailey Gifford and Len Kelly Chase. Next slide, please. What we intend to do, our objective is to build the evidence based policy making. And we have the objective to look at how we can change institutional behavior so that we can release long-term capital um, investment into the green economy and <clears throat> also tackle structural inequalities. 
We want to be able to rec make recommendations to government and regulators so that they can amend policies that support this investment system. And so we're approaching it from our theory of change is stimulate, convene, frame, and influence. And I'll talk about them sort of a little bit in the next se section, which has a timeline as well. So the next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, so it's a 24 month, um, I would say, research journey that has a very strong uh, interactive element. It has a research element led by uh, Professor Ian and his team. To uh, and Ian will talk will tell you more about it. And the, the research piece then interacts very strongly with the convening and stakeholder engagement because we want to make sure that research speaks to the, the experience of the practitioners. So there is a bit of, a, there is a ground truthing element in it. And simultaneously, we need to be able to engage with the political narrative early on. So if we were aiming for political change, we need to bring the, bring test different framings and bring the politicians who will, who can shape the policy space so that they're on board throughout this journey. And so I would, I would I would think of it more like a two-year sprint, which can lead to long-term outcome. And my final slide, um, will, which is the one, so as I explained, so there is the research work stream, there is a policy intervention, and there's a very strong stakeholder mapping and engagement. And essentially, we think of it as um, action-led research approach because we want to make sure that we are connected to the policy cycles and also the regulatory cycles and we're able to uh, respond to you know the current um, need from the the either the evolving change of political narrative or a window of a policy uh win policy opportunity that opens for recommendations so with that I'll hand over back to Peter thank you Thank you, Anna. That's, that's very interesting. Um, Ashok, I'd like to invite you up to talk about the investment system. Great. Uh, th thank you, Peter, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, almost every system in this country, whether it's energy, transport, water, etc. Sorry, stick with the previous slide, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Almost every system in this country, whether it's energy, transport, water, etc., has the same problem, lack of investment. And this investment can only come from public money or private money. Uh, we actuaries are at the heart of the private investment system. And so we feel that it's incumbent to understand how that investment system operates. And that's what new capital consensus is all about. And we want to invite you into a conversation to help build a common understanding. So what you're seeing is very much a work in progress. What do I mean by investment capital? Uh, the best definition I've ever had of investment capital was from Hugh Osmond, the leading entrepreneur. And he said, as an entrepreneur, an investor gives me money, gives me investment capital. I use that to build a business by undertaking risk and in doing so create value, which enables me to give the investor back more money. And that is at the heart of investment. Of course, existing companies can also do additive investment, but the principles are the same. There are different types of capital uh, and the type of capital available to you will determine the sort of business you're able to build. Next slide, please. You can see on the left-hand column the types of capital, primary equity, long-term debt, bank finance, and then you have secondary trading where you have uh, buying stocks and shares in equity or in debt. Right? Uh, and, and you can see the sorts of business if you, if you want to build a highly cash consumptive, large scale growth business, like a microchip developer, hydrogen power, innovative technology and at scale, you're going to need a lot of private primary equity. 
If, on the other hand, you're creating a cash generative mature business, like a utility or insurance, you can do a lot of that with debt. I was a founder of what's now the Phoenix Group. We built that largely using debt. You can use bank finance to help you build a services business, like a consultancy. But the risk here is that if things go wrong, the losses end up falling on customers and on staff, on employees. So you really, you need a mixture of bank finance and, and, and risk capital, primary equity. And then you have secondary, secondary equity or secondary debt. Uh, and Kay has thrown, uh, so John Kay, who carried out a review 10 years ago, uh, identified, came up with the rather disconcerting finding that secondary equity investment does not, is not conducive to primary equity investment. Uh, so, uh, turning to the system, every system has a purpose, defines what it's there to do. Next slide, please. This is Kay, Sir John Kay's definition of the purpose of the investment system, the, the three aspects that relate to it. He saw it all about being risk management, smooth lifetime consumption, match saving, good investment. The problem we have with this is we question whether it's enough to consider what the system does or whether you need to go further and say, does the system do what it needs to do? If we look at the investment system, and I'll show you what it looks like. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is, this is our view of the investment system, or a view of the investment system. It's, it's a slightly narrower view. And you can see it takes money from consumers, which flows through to asset owners, life companies, pension funds, who give it to fund managers, who invest the money through capital markets into investing companies in different asset classes. These investing companies generate the wealth, which goes back to the investors. It, investment consultants and financial advisors also play a role. Now, there are other parties involved in this, but these are the main uh, decision makers. And there's six trillion pounds of personal financial UK wealth in this system, three times GDP. And this is principally that the ONS describe as retirement money, money that sits in pension funds, life companies, ISAs, et cetera, that's invested in that through that. It's also the system that irrigates the economy with capital. And we as actuaries may think that this system works quite well, but we are getting a lot of challenge. So Paul Collier, for example, in this lecture series a, a couple of years ago, challenged the balance between uh, security and returns and whether we as actuaries were too focused on security and insufficiently on returns. So it, I don't think we can be complacent and say this is working well. And there's another way that you can look at this system, which leads, which helps lead us to this conclusion. If you add in the purpose of companies, next slide, please. You can see that the purpose of companies, and here I use Colin Mayer's decision, yeah, sorry, Colin Mayer's definition, the purpose of companies is to deliver goods and services to consumers that address the problems of people and planet and do not create problems. And if you add that in, then you, you end up with a very different uh, picture because you have money going from consumers with money, going to companies that deliver goods and services to a wider set of consumers. And if, for example, we only channel money to companies in the southeast of England and not in Hartlepool and Blackpool, we're going to help 
increase inequality. If we only channel money to broad industries or broad companies rather than to green companies, we're not going to help green the economy. So that leads you, us to a, 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 a different definition of purpose. Next slide, please. And you can see the, the definition of purpose that we are currently working with. It's not just about allocating capital, but it's also enabling investors to make acceptable real returns and businesses to thrive by delivering goods and services in a way that Colin Mayer would, would anticipate. And we believe that provides a better basis for assessing effectiveness. But we don't believe we can look at this system as a market. Uh, there's multiple markets in it. They're not particularly subject to supply and demand. Uh, they don't compete on the basis of superior investment returns, and there are long delays in decision-making processes. So we think you need to look at this as a complex adaptive system. Next slide, please. So we, our current way of looking at it is to look at it in, as manufacturing of capital and distribution of capital with the asset owners and investment consultants helping to manufacture the capital, which is then provided to investment managers and capital markets to distribute. And this helps bring out the role of actuaries because actuaries sit in the manufacturing of capital. They set the risk appetite of the asset owners and determine the asset allocations. So let me focus on the manufacturing and ask what sort of capital does the system produce? Next slide, please. And you can see what I've done in this manufacturing capital box is replace the, the company entity type with the liability type. And we believe that the better it's better to look at you, you get more insight if you look to separate into traditional life insurance, DB pensions, and then the pots that are driven by the consumer. Defined contribution unit link direct. Next, so, so let me build on that. Next slide, please. And you can see if you take that, those are the three main pots. Next slide, please. And we've roughly split the six trillion pounds into this. Now these are guesstimates. And all of this, all of our work will be confirmed by the academic research, which Ian will talk about. And if you take traditional life insurance, you can see that it typically generates predominantly debt capital. And that's driven by solvency to regulation, which drives matching investment strategies. Defined benefit pensions, the middle line, should be able to generate equity capital, because it is greater, defined benefit pension schemes have greater ability to diversify risk over time, but that's been negated by the accounting. And as a result, DB pensions generate, typically today, only debt, predominantly debt capital. The consumer defined stuff, the defined contribution unit linked direct stuff, um, is typically driven into secondary investment by the consumer conduct liquidity requirements. Uh, so if I summarize this, next slide, please. You can see we've got four types of capital, debt and equity, primary and secondary. And you can see the investment system today currently generates a lot of debt primary and secondary, but it generates very little equity risk capital and particularly almost no primary equity risk capital. And so if we need to ask ourselves why companies like Arm, CRH, Ferguson, et cetera, choose to list in the US rather than London, why we struggle to retain growth companies why we in the UK have low productivity may be part of the answers 
lie in this, the way the system operates. Thank you. Back to you, Peter. Thank you, Ashok. That's uh, very insightful. I'd now like to hand you over to Ian, who's going to talk through uh, looking through at the investment system through a systems thinking lens. So, morning all. Thank you for attending. And there's some very interesting questions popping up already. So, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? So, I think. Where I am coming at this from is from a long time from being outside of the system in general, looking at it with a, a staggering amount of curiosity as to what goes on. And it goes back to a piece of work for me that I did for the Institute and Faculty, um, looking at economic theory and actuarial practice. And through that, I got to speak to the great and the good I get, got to speak to the actuarial royalty, essentially, and a few very high profile thinkers outside of the profession too. And one of the, one of the questions that was identified through that work, it was flagged to me by Sir John Kay um, in a book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy by a professor at UCLA called Richard Drummond. And the question in that book, the most fundamental question in that book for me is quite a simple one. What's really going on? And that question in its simplicity makes it extremely difficult because actually, if we think about how we would like to understand things, to understand the financial system or the investment system, there are huge numbers of components to that. And if we just look at DB pensions, and most of what I talk about today will be DB, but the, the project itself extends more widely. Actually, we have systems within systems. And so if we look at DB pensions, we have the government via the Department for Work and Pensions and everybody else that might have a stake or a say in pensions in general. We've got a legal system. We have regulation via the pensions regulator. We've then got overlapping regulators with different responsibilities. So we've got the FCA as a conduct regulator, and we've got the Financial Policy Committee and the PRA. We've got the Bank of England. We've got investment advisors, actuaries, trustees, asset managers, sponsors, employees, accountants. And all of these people have their own little system within this much bigger system. And that's just DB pensions. So if we think then about DB pensions and put that into that descriptive world that Ashok presented, there are all these little mini systems and you have to understand a little bit about all of them to be able to just start to build that picture up. And economic thinking or traditional research in an academic sense we'll look at financial markets. You might look at equity markets, and you can be an expert in that, but you never look at bond markets to the same extent. And when you then think about how do we look at the system, to be able to piece all of this together becomes extremely complicated, but that's actually the challenge that we've got to, to address, because if we don't understand the financial system as a whole, we then can answer the question, is it achieving its purpose? And is that purpose effective in terms of what we would like it to do for society? And I think there's some really interesting questions. Louise put a question in about what about workers? And I think that's a great question because we've not really thought about it to that level of granularity, but there's clearly this levels problem. So we need to be able to think about it as a system as opposed to silos where I am an asset manager and I only think about my little bit. So if we go to the next slide, please. And I think where we get to in this for me is if we don't think about the system as a whole, we end up with systemic risks. Because if everybody's focused on their own discrete part of the system, then if everybody's very much in their day job, and nobody's got that capacity to step back and look at the system and say, 
what's really going on here. Is this system achieving its purpose? Is it going to be effective? Is there, is there any risks in this system? And I think that was so very clearly seen in the LDI crisis and the guilt market crisis late last year. And this was not something that was solely caused by the mini budget. So for me personally, and let's be very clear, this is my view, it's not the view of everybody else on this, this panel. LDI was unwinding. What the, the, the mini budget did was it stressed an already increasingly stressed system. And actually the whole thing was predictable. And I know that because I pointed out that this was going in the wrong direction. And from within the system, everybody was doing their day job, everybody was following what the regulator wanted, everybody was thinking about it as a business as usual scenario. But how do we then think about interpreting signals that come from outside of the system? So what we've seen at the end of 2021 was very explicit and very clear signals from the Bank of England. Inflation is back, the bank said it was transitory, other things have then made it slightly stickier and central banks in general don't deal with inflation quite in the right way. They always think it's not going to be as bad as it is and then they probably overshoot in terms of their interventions but they are dealing with something extremely difficult. But those signals that interest rates were going up were very, very clear at the end of 2021. So if the people in the system understood what was going on at a macro level, then it was very clear that those products and services that were sold as LDI were going to go the other way, but the system didn't respond. So it's a really different, difficult problem to work out signal and noise. I think in the case of LDI, it was very clear what was going to happen with interest rates. And what we've seen was the system unable to respond. And I think just now, the, that falls for me very much on the regulatory environment as opposed to market participants. But just now for me, we have what I would consider to be custodians of silos. And what we actually need is custodians of the system overall. So could we go to the next slide, please? So if we then look at where we're at today, and why I still think we need systems thinking and why I think this project has quite a significant amount of potential impact within it, is can we identify siloed thinking in the world of DB today? And as a sort of thought experiment, um, I think the current discussions about de-risking via risk transfers, whether that's through buy-in with an insurance company or through buy-out with an, an insurance company, highlight some of the different things that go on when we look at it as a system as opposed to a transaction. So the first thing we've got for me is we've got the system of DB interacting with the system of insurance. And what happens when those two systems interact because usually we think about them very discreetly actually we've got to think about them not as discrete systems but we've got to think about them as interacting systems and we've got this transition from one to another we also see this in the world of dc pensions um where we go from an accumulated pot to some decumulation vehicle so we've got these shifting systems all the way through and i think we've got to start to look these things more holistically to then start to answer the questions below. So if we take de-risking and risk transfers in DB, the first question is, is it possible? And by that, I mean, we've got a trillion or so DB pension liabilities. What's the capacity in the insurance market to do these transactions? Roughly speaking, in about the past 15 years or so, there has been about 63 billion of buy out. There's probably been about 175 billion of buy-in. That gets us over a decade of time with about, let's be generous, 250 billion of transactions. And this year is going to be a bumper year for risk transfer. That's maybe going to get us another 50, 60 billion of some description of DB world going to the world of insurance. So the first thing we can say is, 
is this transition possible at the scale at which it's being described? The answer for me is clearly very, is, is clearly no. So what we've then got to say is, for all those transactions that take place, it's going to be relatively small. So for the vast majority of DB world, it's business as usual. So that has consequences and we have to think about what that means. If we then say, let's assume that it was possible to do trans transitions from DB world to D, uh, insurance world at a much larger scale, let's say half a trillion, is that a sensible thing to do? And there's multiple perspectives. So for an employer perspective, they might say, yes, that transaction is eminently sensible for me at my micro level because I can move my DB pension liabilities from my company balance sheet to the balance sheet of an insurer. That makes sense. But if we then think about all of those micro transactions and stand back and say, well, what does that actually mean for society as a whole? What does that mean for the capital that has been accumulated? And how is that going to be deployed within the real economy? We might arrive at a very different answer. We also have the wonderful financial alchemy of going from accounting for pensions to accounting for insurance and the, the, trans, the transformation of that capital as to how it's represented as assets and liabilities in the balance sheet of a company versus an insurer. There is something untoward that goes on in there and we need to think about that too because I think there are significant unintended consequences. And so we then can step back once again and say, are there alternatives to this? And I don't have any just now, let's be clear. But we have to be asking questions. Are there better ways to do this? Not only in terms of the world of DB, but also in the world of DC, because we have to have much more capacity to be a risk and make sense of investments in the real economy than I think we have today. So can we go to the next slide, please? Can we have the next slide, please? No, oh, thank you. So for me, if we can move away from siloed thinking, I think we can start to get better outcomes for society as a whole. Now, the, the statement at the top is from Lord Hollick of the Industry and Regulators Committee, and he was talking about liability-driven investment. The pensions regulators should be given a statutory duty or ministerial direction to consider the impacts of the pension sector on the wider financial system. And I think that sums up for me personally the problems we have had within the financial system for well over 20 years now, which is everything's looked at discreetly as opposed to holistically. And for me, if we can think more systemically, we can build resilience into the system. We can ask that question, what is going on? Is the system achieving its purpose? And whether it's actually doing the things that we would want it to do in terms of the deployment of capital into the economy, productivity, leveling up, and all these other things. These are significant asks of the financial system, but I think we should be asking this of the system because just now, for me, it does not work at a societal level. The other thing about looking at it as a system, as opposed to a silo, is we can identify leverage points. And by the identification of leverage points, we can show where in the system we can intervene. And leverage points are an interesting framework that sit alongside systems thinking, because actually when you look at the hierarchy of leverage points, the least impactful leverage point in a system is taxes and regulation. So the standard tools of government are actually some of the least and least effective tools for intervening in a system. So by bringing all of this together through this project, what we would like to be able to do is show where we can actually move the purpose of the financial system to a better place. And I think that's me to time. And I think we're now going to move on to questions. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, yes, as I said earlier, uh, I feel your discussions are very much enhanced by the, the contributions and questions that people ask. So, so please type your question in the, the Q&A uh, box uh, on Zoom. Um, we've had some very interesting questions in already. Uh, I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask uh, 
I'm going to ask the panel uh, around uh, one of the questions that Louise Pryor has answered. Uh, asked. Uh, so we're talking about the interests of investors, acceptable real returns, and about the planet and society. But what about the interests of workers? Investors expect a return on the money, uh, but what sort of return should those who con contribute time and undergo stress through their labour get? Uh, Ashok, I don't know if you'd like to answer that yeah. one. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very interesting question, Louise. And if, if you take the diagram I put up, we, put up of the investment system with consumers on one end and consumers on the other end. I could have replaced workers at one end and workers at the other end, which would give you a subset of the system and would help to draw out the uh, interests of workers because fundamentally a lot of this is retirement money that's provided to pension schemes on behalf of workers then workers sit in the box in terms of the success of the companies and, and the, uh, the, the products and services that are produced. So that lens, we hope, will give us some insight into the question you've just asked. I'm not, it's not a full answer, but I think that is, is, a, is a, a way we might attempt to answer the question. Okay, thank you. And another question for an anonymous attendee. If companies choose to raise capital via debt or equity, what's what's wrong with debt capital if it's still contributing to, to company growth? Uh, I don't want to do all the talking responding here, Peter, but uh, mm -hmm. Look, it's it's a question of balance, and if you if you don't have the question from if you have too much debt, we could end up with the sorts of problems that we've been seeing: uh, over leveraged companies, uh, bubbles in certain asset classes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you have I'm equally concerned about the lack of insufficient primary equity because we need primary equity if we're going to address some of the, if we're going to green the economy, uh, build more growth businesses, uh, address inequality in certain parts of the country. I guess it's part of the point that effectively debt equity is not always that suitable for certain types of risk within, within um uh startups and, and entrepreneurship and and um investing as well yes you, you can end up socializing risk by using debt okay. i think another part of it is that's a binding constraint so actually it starts to reduce your flexibility and i think that can then hamper growth ultimately because actually you want businesses to be able to be flexible and move with the economy, but as you become increasingly more leveraged, you become increasingly more constrained by that debt because you must make the interest payments, otherwise you'll find yourself insolvent. And I think as we've moved over the past years, 10 years or so from ultra low interest rates, and we're going back now to a world of what you would consider to be slightly more normal interest rates, I think that trade-off becomes much more apparent and much starker because the cost of service and the debt is now going to be greater. So as you roll over debt and everything else, equity capital is going to be more attractive from a corporate perspective. So we need to find ways to be able to provide that capital um, because I think the demand for it is going to be higher. And I don't think we have a regulatory system that enables us to do that effectively just now within the world of pensions and insurance. Okay, thanks. Okay, there's a few questions coming from uh, Michael Clark, uh, some very valuable contributions. Uh, it, it, he's commending FinStick to make it clear to actuaries when we say model, we tend to think of numbers, formula, martingales, et cetera. This is quite dangerous. Uh, leading UK pension funds tackling climate change realize that the seabed scenario models are useless. Uh, taking a different path, they realize that such a model is a special case of a scenario narrative. If FinStick can convince our profession that the mental models 
uh, need to be generalised. Uh, we shall owe great debt to Finstick. If not, then Einstein's quote about not solving today's problems with thinking it costs tomorrow, that caused them, uh, will be attached to it forever. Uh, please comment. And he adds additional context to this, which is around the kind of CBES model at four degrees, the, the reduction expected return of our pension fund, four degrees warming, uh, expected reduction in return on our pension fund is 1%. Uh, so let's put reputational risks for, for actuaries today with the, the current setup. But just wondering if there's anyone from the panel who's, who's got comments on, on that point. Ian, do you want to start? So I agree completely with what Mike has said about those scenarios in terms of when you think about that, you step back from it and say four degrees. So if, if the Paris is two, under two degrees, if not one and a half degrees, allows the planet to survive four degrees, you're not going to have a pension. So we, we have other societal systemic problems in that, that climate out, in that climate scenario, where I think CBES has been useful, and I have to say this because that's, this is what my research has shown, um, which, again, I'm only speaking from my view of this research, not my colleagues who did it with me, is while those scenarios have the failings that Mike has um, shown, what they have done is they've created a movement within the central banking system in the UK to start to look at um, climate risks and what it, they could imply for insurers and for banks. And I think going forward, those scenarios were a good starting point. There are issues like the fixed balance sheet and everything else. But as a starting point to start to build capacity and to do the first real climate stress test that I'm, I'm aware of at a central bank level done in this way, it has moved things considerably and built capacity in the market. And from that, while it is imperfect in many, many ways, I think that shift in risk, I'm thinking about risk, thinking about climate risks, the capacity, the modelling, we will be able to bring in much more sophisticated scenarios to this and things are much more realistic. But you're, for me personally, you were always sort of between a rock and a hard place. Either we do things that are much more realistic and much more sophisticated and people can't do it because it's technically too difficult because the capacity is not there. Or we do something which is very imperfect in the ways in which Mike has described, but we allow people to actually start to build the technical expertise and capacity. So through time, I think this will evolve into something which is much more robust and resilient. But for where we are today, I think it was the most pragmatic and sensible way to go about it from a central bank perspective. If, if, I, if I can just also add to that, I, Mike, I think you're challenge about models is spot on. And, and I worry a lot about our models assuming linearity in a world where we're not going to have linearity, we're going to have discontinuities. And our risk models should, review, should reflect what we think the world's going to look like. And if they don't reflect what the world looks like, then are they going to give us the right answers? And, and we, we think this is such an important point uh, that at FinSIG we've been, uh, we're developing a work, a, a seminar on this for later in the year, uh, potentially together with the uh, NED MIG uh, to, to think about uh, risk models and what sort of risk models we should be using and how we use them to make decisions. Okay, thank you, Asha Kanin. Uh, I think Anna's so can I come in? Sorry, on... Yeah, Anna. Yep. So I want to make a comment, which is not from a model perspective, but from a um, sort of environmental and climate activist perspective, as in, you know, if we read all the reports, the, the recent report that came out from IPCC as well, which is climate impact doesn't happen in isolation, right? It happens in the context of... It, well, it happens, it, it touches the real economy, but also not one economy, but multiple economies. And it has multiplying effects in terms of, um, you know, one set of climate impact will have cascading impact on the food production capability or the resilience of an infrastructure. 
in one place, in one country that may compound other kind of, uh, and, and not only compound, but increase uh, in other regions. And so that sort of, first that circles back to the, uh, the point that Yin was making about the system level, but also the, the, it's the overlapping of the multiple systems. And so everything that we look from a research and scientific, not from a scientific perspective is the way we are trying to squeeze the discussion into a model is definitely not adequate to whatever future world uh, or the direction of travel that we're now moving into. Thanks, thanks, Anna. Uh, now, just move on to another question asked by an anonymous attendee. Um, what can the investment system in the UK learn from comparable systems globally? Uh, Ian, if you would like to take it on first. Yeah, so I think one of the things that's really important is once we've got a, I don't want to use the word model anymore. Um, once we've got a picture of the investment system in the UK, and once we've identified with a lot of road testing um, with a advisory panel, hopefully with some of the people on this call and various other stakeholders, we would then be wanting to look internationally to see, well, where are things done better? Or where are things done in a way which we can learn from? Because I don't think we, are, we, we need to reinvent the wheel. For me personally, one of the biggest failings of the UK since probably the dot-com crisis has been our inability to take risk. So I think governments and successive governments of all, from all sides don't like risk, not because they don't like it, because they don't like dealing with the failures of it. So we don't have the mechanisms to say, well, in a system, not everything works. So it's about how we allow things to fail and rectify it. And so I think there's probably examples where um, that's done much better uh, across the world. I think one area, and I'm going to sort of jump onto Ashok here, where I think there's an interesting comparison, is between insurance in the UK and insurance in Canada. Um, and if, because there are some, Ashok's got some really quite disconcerting statistics about what was the global standing of insurance in the UK to where it is today um, and where global insurance is in Canada say and I think that really comes down to a better regulatory regime and a better understanding of how to manage risk so I don't know if you want to say anything on that Ashok. Yeah uh, thanks Ian um, it, it's I, I sit on the board of Sun Life uh, financial, which is a, a leading, sorry, Canadian uh, insurer. And I find it fascinating to compare the Canadian approach to regulation to the UK approach to regulation. Uh, the Canadian approach is far more balanced between opportunity and risk than the UK approach. And it's more long term in thinking. And so I find as a result that Canadian institutions are far better able to invest in long-term assets, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, than UK institutions. I also find that Canadian institutions are able to manage risk on behalf of consumers far better. So for example, with profits is still a thriving product within Canada and Canadian insurers do an awful lot more in managing healthcare for consumers than we do in the UK. Uh, and how much of this is due to regulation? I think regulation plays a large part. Um, it, one very, very interesting statistic for me is that uh, a year ago at a strategy meeting, uh, we, the, the management team put up a chart of the top 25 largest global life insurers and there were three canadians uh at the, one manual life at nine son at 12 and uh great west at 13 of the top 25 global life insurers there was only one uk which is legal in general at 19th and legal in general was going down the charts whereas the canadians were going up 
And if we had taken that same chart 15, 20 years ago, it would have given a very different picture. You'd have had three UK ones up there and the Canadians probably wouldn't have featured. And I find that dramatic shift between the success of Canadian life insurers and UK life insurers to be quite stark. And, and I think a large part of this is down to uh, risk and how we think about risk in the UK and the emphasis we place on risk in the UK. Uh, the reason you have brakes on a car is so you can go faster. But if you drive with the brakes on the whole time, you're not going to get anywhere. OK, thank you. That uh, leads uh, quite nicely into the next uh, question from uh, Robert Dundas, uh, which is, do you have plans to uh, reconsider what measures stroke reporting is used to assess success or otherwise? Ian, I don't know if you'd like to, to take, take that one. Yeah, so we would like to look at that as part of this because I think it's really important. One of the ongoing discussions um, that we have is around how investment mandates are set. And I think this was identified in the care review and it's been highlighted in multiple places, but quarterly reporting is problematic because it means we're focused on the next three months. What is, a, what is the aim of a particular product? I think is really important and how do we set the mandates around the investment for that because just now the way in which it's done is relative to arbitrary benchmarks and if one wanted to be challenging we would say benchmarks that are not necessarily aligned to the outcome of the end consumer rather than aligned to the performance metrics of the people providing the product or service and so I think that's really fundamental that we have to understand how investment mandates are set and, is, and ask the question, are there better ways to set them? And I think just now the focus on the near term and the short term is counterproductive to long term outcomes and goals. Yeah, Pete, Peter, if I can also mm. add yeah. into this, I, I, I think we also need to think about risk measures, which are based upon what matters to the consumers. Uh, the consumers who are investing money uh, and, and the consumers at the other end of the chain. You know, for example, uh, if, I'm a, if, I'm, if I want a pension, then are we actually doing enough to measure, does the system deliver me the quality of pension I need? Or are our systems just too much based upon market-based measures, uh, which like volatility, which actually, as a consumer, I don't really care that much about. What I care about is, 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 is am I going to get what I need out of the system? And so we, I think that's quite a big debate that we need to have. OK, thank you. Uh, next question from, from John Taylor. Uh, citizens sometimes have a, a variety of conflicting needs. Uh, as a consumer, you want risky business to be funded, but as a saver, the same citizen might not want the capital exposed to the risks exposed to such a, an investment. Uh, how does such a framework uh, recognise this? I don't know if anyone's keen from a panel to take that, that question. I'll go for that one. I like that one. Well, actually, I like all the questions, but that one, that one felt like it neatly followed on from what we've just been talking about. So one of the things where I think the finance, the investment system has fallen down very badly is it comes back to this notion of how we manage risk on, on behalf of other people. And I think one of the things I always find very frustrating is finance is complex and it's the only area of the general economy I can think of where we expect people to take control so and, and be responsible for really quite difficult things over a very long time period. So I trust that my doctor will give me the correct prescription and um, being from Glasgow when I have a heart attack at a very early age, I presume the consultant who then operates on me and saves my life um, is sufficiently qualified to do their job 
car mechanics fix cars. We don't expect people to understand cars and all the complexities around them unless they choose to do so. Finance is the only place where we expect somebody to do all of these extremely difficult things and be responsible for it, as opposed to having a system where the experts look after the people who provide the capital. And for me, I think the system falls down on that point. And I think we need to get the system to a place where it's delivering those consumer outcomes and managing those risks effectively to the best of our ability for people, as opposed to expecting people to do it themselves. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've just reached the time limit for our question and answers now. So um, I'd like to very much thank everyone for, for contributing the questions. I'd also like to thank our panelists today, Ashok, Anna, and Ian for, for uh, their excellent comments and very uh, thought-provoking presentations. Uh, I'd like to just um, encourage you to, to uh, give us feedback on this um, on, on this session today. Uh, please use the kind of QR code which is, is displayed in front of you just now. I'd also like to remind you to attend the, the fourth uh, slot in a presidential speaker series. Uh, this is on power of purposeful business and this takes place on Thursday. And then uh, finally, this is um, uh, if you do want to get further involved uh, in the new capital consensus project, then uh, please uh, please send us a, a message through LinkedIn, uh, either to myself or, or to any of the panelists, uh, and we'll be able to kind of get in touch with you uh, regarding any uh, any thoughts you might have or any contributions you might be able to make. Uh, so I'd, I'd just like to conclude today's event. So thanks once again for joining us and goodbye.